Hello. My name is David Gilbert. You can learn more about me if you care at blog.daveg.ca. I've been using BSD since 1995. First NetBSD on a Sun 4 slash 260. Then, actually after that, uh, NetBSD on a Sun 3 slash 260 that I configured for my wife. And then also an Amiga after that. Shortly thereafter, I used BSDI at work. Shortly after that, I configured FreeBSD, first time uh, on a 486 from spare parts to get better serial performance because as mammoth as the Suns were, they didn't have the technology of buffers on their serial ports. Then after that, FreeBSD is routers, servers, and desktops uh, at a company that provided internet service to Ontario and Quebec. And around about that time, um, I was at the first or second BSD con down in California in Monterey. So that's me. So, swapping what now? The uh, name of this talk is a little bit strange. But it all starts with my quest for the perfect workstation. Now, the perfect workstation would be portable, have a battery that lasts longer than any day that I would have, including uh, some fairly brutal usage. Uh, would run several OS's at the same time, not have to boot back and forth, and would be secure. And especially when I say secure, I'm talking about uh, not just secure from the network or secure from someone trying to hack it physically, but secure in that I would have control over all of the hardware. The hardware is mine. Uh, most pertinently, things like the Intel uh, install and configure environment that has been part of PCs for more than the last 10 years or so that um, most of us have no documentation or visibility into. But the reality is that security pretty much sucks. Dual booting pretty much sucks. It just does. And operating systems, well, in general, they suck somewhat. I mean, I don't want to rag on it too hard. Windows is what it is. And nothing I say here or shout at the internet or what have you is going to change what Microsoft does with their operating system. FreeBSD or StarBSD, and I say this as someone who's been using BSD for a long time, um, sometimes on the desktop and sometimes not. Um, I suppose sucks is too strong a word. It doesn't really. It just, it's inconsistent and sometimes a hassle to use FreeBSD as a desktop. It requires a lot of extra work and dedication. You start to feel like it's almost a cause at times. And I say all that not being able to read the room and whether people are staring at me in derision or chuckling. I hope chuckling. I mean it in the nicest way. I can't improve all of these things, but what I can help us look at is part and parcel of the dual booting problem. Here's what I want to achieve with this talk. Since roughly 2005, and that was a time in my life when I got back into playing video games, um, and since that didn't just mean things like Tux Racer, it meant that I was using Windows and you could either boot into Windows and then boot back to do work and sort of losing all of your state or so on and so forth or you could be uh, using a remote desktop to do your work so on and so forth. There's many compromises but few real solutions. So what I want to do here is boot from Windows and run BSD as a guest. But not just that, also be able to boot from BSD and run Windows as a guest. But I want to do that on the same machine. And not only that, I want to do that with the same installs of each operating system. And this configuration has only somewhat recently 
recently become reasonably feasible or almost feasible. So this is a BSD conference. Let's first talk about FreeBSD as the host, as the ruler of the entire machine. FreeBSD as the host is actually pretty easy to approach. Beehive now runs Windows somewhat well. And Geom makes addressing partitions and disks reasonably transparent. One item that I encountered in preparing this presentation was it would have been useful if Geom had a device that operated somewhat like the Union file system operates. The idea here is to have a read-only copy um, and have a read-write uh, modification of that copy as a separate layer such that you could test booting Windows without having Windows scribbling all over itself and blowing up. And that uh, we don't have yet, but uh, I don't know. Maybe that's a project that I will approach and talk about uh, next BSD can. Anyways. So Windows 10 is a guest, and at this point I am going to start up. I had to do this on my laptop because my uh, Windows on my workstation was not backing up well. So we're starting here. So this is a hardware installation of Windows. This is Windows that runs directly on the hardware of the machine. And again, I apologize for the motion sickness of the camera here, but the, um, uh, the system, I, I bought an HDMI recorder and it was definitely not working. Uh, so Now Windows here is installed on uh, a SATA uh, flash disk and FreeBSD is sitting on a, um, an NVMe flash disk. So it's a pretty snappy system. Um, you'll also notice that I'm using Refind here uh, as the tool for booting uh, multiple systems um, on UEFI. It works pretty well. So here's FreeBSD booting on the hardware. Now, one of the things we're going to see here in a minute um, is that Windows freaks out the first time booting on uh, the emulation. Now, what you don't see here is I put uh, Windows to boot in safe mode and booted it several times under the emulations. By booting in safe mode, you protect against the problem uh, where Windows sees it needs another driver and basically just stops. It, it doesn't auto-configure the same disk under a different driver. Now, if you boot in safe mode and then shut off safe mode and boot again, um, it will actually leave these drivers, as far as I remember it saying, it has to load the driver during boot. After boot, it loads the other drivers. And so if you um, boot once in each way that you want to boot, Windows will load uh, both of those drivers before boot, and you can actually boot back and forth. So what you're actually going to see here is after having done that, um, Windows will boot properly, uh, both under the emulation, and then afterwards it also boots um, back on the hardware properly. Now some of you might remember that Windows had a thing in Windows 7 called Hardware Profiles. This was something that if you had a laptop and it docked and it grew a whole bunch of hardware and then it undocked and it, it, it lost a whole bunch of hardware, then the um, hardware uh, profiles would allow you to manage this process. Hardware profiles are no longer a thing-ish. 
with Windows. I think under the hood, it's still using uh, hardware profiles, but it's not saying that it uses hardware profiles. So here we've just started the VM, um, and the VM first fails to boot on the CD-ROM that's attached, and then it starts booting Windows. Um, now this is using the uh, the ATA disk, which was <coughs> so far the only way I got um, Windows to boot. I couldn't get it to boot fully on the virtual disk, and I don't know if there's a performance difference. I suspect there is some. <coughs> But I've always also found that Windows has a bit of a performance problem with respect to reading and writing disk under Beehive. Now this is 12.1. I don't know, I suspect there might be some uh, improvements on virtual device performance. But you can see here that the Windows boot under emulation on an otherwise idle machine is quite significantly slower. I also haven't bothered with this example of reconfiguring the network on wired network. <coughs> Excuse me. On wired network, it appears to um, switch back and forth automatically, but on the wireless network, it tends to uh, need a manual poke to use the, uh, the wired network when no wireless network uh, any longer exists uh, in Windows. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you'll see here that things take quite a bit longer. Um, the icons take a little bit longer to, to pick up. The actual processing is fine but the um, the disk access can be really slow. And in a second here, I am going to um, open up the start menu. And if you open it up several times, it uh, gets faster. But if you watch the start menu open up, uh, populating the icons uh, is a little laggy. So it does eventually happen. Um, but again, this is an SSD, so you really don't expect uh, to see this. And also, the um, we're giving Windows 8 gig of memory here, so it's not a, a Windows um, swapping uh, uh, error. Uh, the, the laptop has 32 gig of RAM. And so, BSD has lots of memory to give, and that's how slow it is. Now, um, on the BSD side, you can have Windows as a partition, and you can actually even mix and match um, partitions to create a virtual disk for Windows. Um, as we'll see when we get to the next part of it, that's not the case on the other side. performance and shutting down is leaving a little bit to be desired. This again is on my laptop simply because the the backup system I use for my workstation on Windows uh, was refusing to guarantee for me that the uh, C drive backup was actually entirely consistent and I still have uh, tickets open with that. So, we're just down to the last little bit here. Um, I don't know how to make the uh, video go faster, but it shuts down pretty quick. <coughs> and we will... quickly uh, reboot into Windows again. Just to show that that's possible. Again, the trick here is on Windows first the first time that you're going to run the, the Windows installation under the emulator, you want to have 
run Windows not under the emulator, enabled safe mode, then booted in the emulator, disabled safe mode while it's booted in the emulator, and then rebooted once more in the emulator to solidify or check that it's booted properly. <laughs> I also find that the, actually the first time that Windows boots, it's actually a little bit slower. Next, we want to look at Windows 10 as the host, and I'm not going to spend an inordinate amount of time on Windows 10 as the host, um, but there are some significant things to go over. Windows Hypervisor now supports raw disks, but not partitions. <clears throat> that is, as far as I can tell, there's no way to mount a partition. This means that you have to have a separate disk for your FreeBSD installation because you just can't mount it. Now some of you might ask why not VirtualBox and my answer there is twofold. Uh, one, uh, when you mount hard disks through VirtualBox um, the names and orders of them will change if you so much as plug in a USB stick. And so that's obviously not ideal and not very useful. Uh, also, I hate Oracle, and also I find it annoying that <clears throat> VirtualBox requires a reboot, an annoying reboot every time that it updates. And at some point when I was, was using VirtualBox, it was updating every week or two, and it was just beyond annoying. Uh, VMware uh, is fairly expensive and I don't use it. That's the reason why not VMware. Now an interesting caveat here is Trim is not supported on host, is not passed through to host disk hardware. Uh, if you read about Trim support in Hyper-V, you'll see it say it's supported, but what it means actually is different than what you'd expect. It means that it is supported with respect to disk as file emulation. So with a regular disk as file emulation, um, the trim is used to keep that emulated file smaller by knowing which blocks are being deleted. And um, so, I mean, it is useful, but the trim is not supported as in being passed to the host disk hardware. And in several tests, um, I was using the workstation to run Podrier. Po I'm even Canadian and I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. Uh, so that uh, when I was running the tests in succession and really hammering the uh, twin, uh, and in that case RAID 1 um, NVMe uh, SSDs, uh, they started getting slow and having very significant pauses right into the disk. And I can only assume that without the trim happening, that eventually after enough usage, the NVMe firmware was starting to get confused. You can mitigate that somewhat with, um, I've been told, new uh, code checked into ZFS. Doing a ZFS scrub would actually correctly release the free blocks to trim. Um, but it's not all unicorns and rainbows. Anyways. Win 10 is also now less stupid with all the CPUs pegged and the uh, but on the minus side the guest console video can disappear randomly and this is not just a FreeBSD problem it appears to be uh, a Windows in general problem. So here we have and this video will be better uh, FreeBSD uh, booting as a guest. And so this is on my workstation. Um, I don't really have a cooler background, but I wasn't sure about the copyright of the background. So I uh, just have a default Microsoft background. One of the first things you have to realize is that uh, you will sometimes see your uh, FreeBSD disks as not connected or not found. Um, this can occasionally happen. Uh, when significant changes have happened to the system. I actually caused it to happen uh, just to have an example so that you guys would be seeing what I see.
Um, but, uh, so yeah, here we go. You go in and you ask, uh, yeah, to disable the um, disks in Disk Manager, which is Windows X and Disk Manager. And then you can reopen, and actually it'll usually auto attach them, uh, but if not, you can attach them again if that's necessary. <clears throat> so I'm just showing here, and it actually keeps the same numbers. It actually keeps the numbering fairly uh, consistent, even when you plug and unplug uh, hardware uh, uh, to the USB ports. So, here we go. Uh, booting the FreeBSD. This is not a surprise to anybody. I've just caused the video software to pop the window up and make it bigger and easier to read. Um, in this case, we've given 32 gig to, to FreeBSD, and so it um, boots up relatively quickly. And in this case, I'm using the text mode of Refind. Uh, I'm not sure why, just the way it defaults on my workstation. But uh, again, Refind is a nice piece of free software, and I'm sure I'll make sure the, the link to Refind is up somewhere. Um, Now, I am not bothering with X here since the um, aforementioned Windows console problem seems to be exacerbated by X, but I, it's, I have seen it happen under, under other operating systems, even Windows, running under Windows. So, uh, and VNC and uh, whatnot work just fine, so there's not a particular need for it. Now, here I'm logging into it over the local network. Obviously, it's easy to configure the local network to work. This is two ZFS disks. Now, you'll notice here they appear as SCSI disks, not NVMe disks. This is how the pass-through happens with Windows. And again, the trim... I actually have even forced FreeBSD to support the trim or forced FreeBSD to send the trim commands, and they don't make it through to the hardware. Um, so Windows just doesn't pass it. It doesn't advertise trim availability. Now the next thing I'm going to go through here is just to give you an idea of the performance. Now this is a thread ripper and it would normally uh, perform this task um, in about the same time. Uh, we're looking within 5% of the same performance. Um, and so this is doing a make minus J32 build kernel on the 12.1 I think P5 sources uh, something very recent anyways and if I just blather on for a short little while you'll see it now I actually made the window smaller here because with everything busy the the uh, video compression <laughs> actually failed um, so uh, now HW now this the sys CTL of hw.hv underscore vendor is actually uh, a cool thing to note here. Uh, it's blank when you're booting on the hardware and it's Microsoft space HV when you're booting on the hypervisor. You can use this variable to change behavior in the RC scripts. Um, I believe also uh, uh, in loader, although I haven't tried. And you can also uh, use it in scripts after boot uh, to uh, change uh, behavior of the machine. Um, so that's a useful feature and more than I can I can't find the same thing on Microsoft maybe there's something in the registry but I don't know exactly how to suss it out and I looked for it and did not find it. So maybe someone will help me there. Um, so there we go. Uh, it's very small on the screen. I think it says like a minute 43. So, very fast. And FreeBSD absolutely doesn't mind booting uh, from uh, multiple different uh, sources. And um, obviously, understanding the operating system and how it boots and how it auto configures makes FreeBSD a guest, obviously, sort of the, the easy low hanging fruit of this talk. Uh, and I'm completely fine with that. Cutting back to my slides, 
So the performance, as you see, is good. Within 5% and possibly even within 1%. I didn't spend a lot of time benchmarking back and forth, but I found that as long as I'm not having <coughs> problems with the NVMe uh, slowing down, which as far as I can tell is due to trim, it's not a problem. Um, unlike Microsoft, you can have multiple inter interfaces, either auto, and actually here, I, I've put auto in the slides here because obviously it's the simplest, but because the MAC address changes and I like to have the same IP address for the BSD uh, configure, um, in this case, I actually have the 192.168. I have the local address uh, in both of these because of course, HN0 doesn't exist when it's booted on hardware and MLXEN0 doesn't exist when it's booted on the virtual machine. So I can have both configured to the same address and everything works. It doesn't complain that you've got an extra IF config in your rc.conf. So I didn't need to use the uh, hypervisor vendor syscontrol to make that work. Now, Microsoft's random console, as I say, um, it just vanishes or, or freezes. And I've, as I said, I've seen it do it under Windows 10 as well as under uh, FreeBSD, and I've seen it do it on Linux as well. Um, obviously, XVNC is, is fine to uh, hook up your desktop. Um, and actually, um, remote X applications onto a Windows X desktop works just as fine as well. Uh, the same kind of X setup that you might use for your um, WSL, your Windows system for uh, LS. Put Linux on Windows. Um, and lastly, as I said, I've even used this to have my Threadripper accelerate my Poudrier building. Um, my regular builder is only a 9590 bulldozer. And um, uh, this Threadripper is very significantly faster. Uh, with the caveat that it gets to be about around the same speed once the you know, I've done a number of builds at, at, uh, and, uh, you know, basically saturated the NVMe. More experimentation may be needed there, but I don't know. Okay, so the summary. FreeBSD is the host with Windows 10 as the guest. Honestly, not re quite ready for production, but it, it, it does work in a pinch. Uh, the Windows is slow. I expect, or at least I believe I've heard that FreeBSD 13 is going to bring some better uh, disk performance for Beehive guests, so maybe that's good news. I haven't really had the time to test with FreeBSD current 13. Windows 10 is a host with FreeBSD as the guest. Well, we all know that that works reasonably well. When you're using a FreeBSD guest that is based on disk files in Windows, obviously that works nearly 100%. Um, but the trim issue, um, honestly, the tr trim rears its head if, you, if you're if you making heavy use of the FreeBSD guest. Um, and uh, when you're booting, when you're able to boot both in hardware, um, that appears to uh, be the only problem that I've identified. So, uh, the next part is questions, and that's where this fades to black. <laughs>